to you. Yeah, sir. So very good evening, sir, to one and all. At the onset, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our eminent presenter for this evening, Dr. Koushi Khajra, and all the HCPs who have joined this live session. You can salute all the front uh, frontline warriors of COVID-19 and wish that wish that they should be healthy and safe. In the quest of dissemination of the knowledge, we have our speaker, Dr. Koushi, uh, Dr. Koushi Khajra. With, uh, with his, today's topic is ICS Lava in COPD and Indian Perspective. As a, as a brief introduction of Dr. Hajra, Dr. Hajra is currently the Assistant Professor of Medicine, Jim's uh, Medical College, Vajbaj, West Bengal. Dr. Hajra completed his MBA, MBBS and DPCG from Calcutta Medical College and Hospital. And then he pursued his MD from the Arjipal Medical College and, uh, and Hospital. He is a very eminent academician. Um, throughout his career, so now I am handing over the uh, handing over the uh, question to Dr. Koshi Khajra. Sir, it is over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. A very good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Koshi Khajra. Uh, today I am uh, here to deliver a talk on ICS and LABA in COPD patients at Indian perspective. <clears throat> so COPD, like China. India also contributes a significant growth, growing percentage of COPD mortality in, in, in a, it, it is the highest among the world. And more than 64.7 estimated age standardized death rate per one lakh amongst the both sexes. Now the COPD burden in Indian scenario. Now you can see here, the number of reported cases of COPD in India was around 28.1 million in 1990. And now it is almost 55.3 million in 2016 and around 50% increase. So an increase in prevalence from 3.3% to 4.2% in 2016. And it is also now uh, increasing in trend in 2020 also. So in India, three out of five leading causes of mortalities, which is a non-communicable disease. And whereas COPD is the second biggest cause of death here. Now you can see that 29.2% increase in the crude prevalence in India. You can see here in the map. Now uh, it is around in 1990, and it is this uh, data was uh, collected in 2016. You can see here the global percentage has been increased, and crude prevalence is around 30% increase. So actually, in many studies, in many studies there are uh, the what are the percentage of prevalence in India. Indian perspective in COPD patients, the measured data is usually underestimated. Now, what are the causes of this underestimation? Now, there are some belief. One is tobacco smoking or smoking is the only cause of COPD. This is a belief leads to poor detection of COPD patients in people who have never smoked. So this is the number one cause. Number two is lack of use of spirometry for the diagnosis. So there is the under diagnosis of the COPD patients for our day-to-day -day practices. Now, difficulty in differentiating COPD from asthma. Uh, in many times, whenever a patient comes with a uh, history of shortness of breath, and we may diagnose it as a case of asthma. So we have to differentiate from asthma from COPD because there are some uh, differences in the principle of treatment. So this is a number three cause. And under diagnosis worsens the disease states as well as the quality of life of the patients. So you can see here, these are the causes of COPD. And many times we underestimate these causes. And this is the most important take home message that other than smoking, there are many causes of COPD patients. So, and this causes a underestimation of the total COPD burden in our country. So number one is low awareness under treatment. Number T2 is low utilization of the PFT, lack of spirometry during day to day practices. Now, inhaler use is a social stigma in our country. So, many patients they are requesting the doctors for giving some medicines for the relieving of COPD or shortness of breath. So, they are not, they are not happy with the inhaler. So, low inhaler use. Next is, we know this is the most important cause, high smoking prevalence in our country. 
Next is air pollution exposure. It is increasing in our <clears throat> every day. It is increasing. Now the bio mask smoke exposure. Now for female patient, for non-smoker patient, this is the most important cause of COPD in our country. This is the bio mask smoke exposure. More than one third of the patients, one third of the female patients, female female in our country, they are using bio mask fuel for day to day uh, in kitchen, and this causes COPD. Now the lean and thin patient, the low BMI patient, more lean and thin patient, more chance of COPD. Now the post-infectious bronchial disease. Suppose a patient is having a history of infection in a in a child, and it causes a bronchial disease, and bronchiectatic lungs is a risk factor for the COPD patients. Number four is tuberculosis. The post-tuberculosis TB also causes bronchial disease. The post-tuberculosis lungs is also an important cause of COPD. Parasitic infection in the childhood. So these are the important causes. We may uh, many times we overlook these causes, and these are the causes for causes of COPD. And we have to we have to check. We have to ask for these causes. We have to look for these causes to estimate the actual causes of COPD. Now, uh, this is the important uh, message: the risk factors associated with the development of the COPD. Uh, the most important is. Uh, Bio mass smoke exposure are important contributors for the COPD outside the Western country, where the bio mass fuel uses are more. So most commonly, the take-home message is in female patients, in non-smoker patients, bio mass smoke exposure or or indoor air pollution is an important cause of COPD. There are other supposed factors like some infection, like adenovirus, vitamin D deficiency, uh, low socioeconomic status, alcohol intake. Uh, these are also some contributory factors for the development of the COPD. Now, as I have told in earlier, the biomass exposure in India, around seventy to eighty percent of the homes in India, more than one third, more than two third actually, more than two third of the two third of the homes in India, especially in a rural area, they use biomass fuel for cooking, and this is a data a woman who spends between two to three hours for cooking every day. Inhales more than a million liters of highly polluted air in her lifetime. So, so there are some studies that reported that exposure to wood smoke was associated with more than seventy percent increased risk for having COPD in both men and women. So, biomass exposure is also very important contributory factors for the development of COPD in our country. So. There was a belief that in female patient, before giving a diagnosis of COPD, think think twice. But this is not true. In our day-to-day -day practices, there are many patients in female patient they are having COPD and also or uh, asthma COPD overlap. So female patient shortness of breath it doesn't mean he is having only asthma. There are probability of COPD or asthma COPD overlap. Now, this is a study the prevalence of COPD, COPD and the determinants of underdiagnosis in women exposed to biomass fuel in India. The conclusion was the prevalence of COPD among the women exposed to biomass fuel is very high. A strong correlation was found between the risk of COPD and the duration of the exposure. Now, uh, as I have discussed earlier, these are the, these are the factors for the, these are the determinants of the underdiagnosis of the COPD in Indian study. So uh, these are the factors, as I have told earlier, unavailability of the spirometry, lack of knowledge of biomass, low level of education, ignorance, milder severity of the disease, younger age, and absence of reported symptoms. <clears throat> this, is, this is a study. It shows a systemic inflammatory changes and increased oxidative stress in rural Indian women cooking with biomass fuels. And we can see here, these are the, uh, in a y axis, these are the concentration of the CRP. And in the x axis, this is the biomass exposure, LPG or biomass, and it's a year of biomass cooking. We can see here, concentration of the CRP is increasing. So the study shows that a chronic exposure to the high levels of biomass fuel during cooking in poorly ventilated kitchen increases the possibilities of oxidative stress and systemic inflammation. Also, it leads to, as, as it is a systemic, systematic, systemic inflammation, it will ultimately lead to hypertension, tachycardia, or other systemic disease. COPD is basically a systemic disease. 
another important factor is peripheral blood eosinophilia in COPD. Uh, in different studies, it has been shown that uh, around 35 to 40 percent increase in peripheral blood eosinophil in a COPD patients. It is very important because peripheral eosinophilia it determines the principle or the principle of treatment for this particular variant of the COPD patients. So peripheral blood eosinophilia in COPD patients is also increasing and it is uh, the percentage is around 40 percent. <coughs> now this is two graph you can see here the there is a decline in pre bronchodilator FEV1 in patients receiving ICS inhaled corticosteroids fluticus and propionate 500 microgram twice daily. So we can see the decline. This is this is the declining of the FEV1 in the, as the ERs are increasing at the long term. But you can hear the declining is less as the patient is receiving fluticasone. So the conclusion was the findings suggest that the baseline blood eosinophilia count is more than two percent identifies a group of COPD patients who show a slower rate of decline in FEV1 when treated with ICS. So COPD patients usually treated with a lava long acting beta 2 agonist and anti mascarinic agonist summer uh, but uh, lama but also there is a group which has a uh, peripheral blood eosinophilic count is more than 300 and this variant of patient uh, benefited with the treatment of ics or inhaled corticosteroids here the study was done with the fluticasone propionate now the inhale there is also a, a different studies and i am showing you now, this study shows the inhaled corticosteroids, blood eosinophils, and the FEV1 decline in patients. The conclusion was, regardless of the blood eosinophil count, prevalent inhaled corticosteroid use is associated with the slower rates of FEV1 decline in COPD patients. So, ICS is beneficial for COPD patients for some variant, not for all COPD patients, but for some COPD patients, inhaled corticosteroids is very beneficial. Now, there are another study you can see here, the, both reversible and non-reversible patients, there is a little clinical benefit when patient was treated with inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, it's better than ipratoprium bromide and albuterol. That means anti mascarinic agonist and long-acting beta agonist. So lung function and symptoms improvement with fluticasone propionate plus salmonitol lava ICS combination. So lava ICS combination is uh, causes greater clinical benefit than ipratoprium and albuterol. So, as I had said earlier, there is a, another variant. One was, uh, one was as I discussed earlier, one was peripheral blood eosinophilia, and number two is global preference of asthma COPD overlap. Now, the global preference of asthma COPD overlap based on the population based studies and found that around found that around two percent, two percent of the general population is affected. And as per Gina 2020, concurrent doctor diagnosed asthma and COPD has been reported in between 15 to 32 percent. So there is a group of COPD which is called asthma COPD overlap. So the proportion of patients with asthma COPD overlap was maximum in COPD stage 3, advanced stage of COPD. As the COPD stage is advanced, stage 3 or onwards. The proportion of patients of asthma COPD overlap was maximum. The sputum eosinophilia was, was present in 22.6% and 6.5% in patients with non ACOS. History of asthma was present in 48.4%. So, the ultimately, the conclusion was the asthma COPD overlap represents a large proportion of the COPD patients. This is the most, most important take home message. The ACO represents a large proportion of the COPD patients with younger age of onset. So, the popular belief COPD, COPD, means, uh, COPD means age of onset is more than usually 40. It is very true. But the overlap, overlap patients are usually younger age of onset. So, the asthma COPD overlap represents a large population of around more than 20% of COPD patients with younger age of onset and higher bronchodilator response and better respiratory muscle strength. Now the IgE and eosinophilic count are important biomarkers. So the IgE and eosinophilic count is usually important biomarkers to differentiate HCO from the COPD with limited role of chest, chest imaging. Now uh, this is a important, uh, this is a important uh, competitive study. The present this, uh, these are the symptoms history who are more likely to be a case of asthma and which, patient, which group of patients are more likely to be COPD patients. 
But as we all know, in asthma, usually age of onset is less than 20 years, a young patient. There are variation symptoms over minutes, hours. Usually in asthma, there is a symptoms worsens during night or early morning. Symptoms triggered by the exercise, emotions. Uh, there is a record of reversibility and variable airflow limitation in spirometry. Lung function test is usually normal. So asthma patient usually onset is less than 20 years. They are normal in between attacks and from the previous prescriptions and the family history or other allergic conditions. We can say this may be a case of asthma. And usually, usually there is no worsening of symptoms over time. Symptoms may vary either seasonally or from year to year, but may improve spontaneously or over the immediate response to the bronchodilator. Usually chest X-ray is normal. So asthma patient, usually episodic. The most important factor is asthma is younger age of onset. This is, it is episodic. In between the attacks patients is usually normal. There are usually a family history present. Usually there are history of uh, allergy or atopy. And chest imaging is usually normal. Now the COPD is a, as we can say, we know that usually, usually the age of onset is more than 40 years. There are persistence of symptoms despite treatment. Uh, good and bad days, but always patient is symptomatic. There's chronic cough, chronic cough and sputum production. And this is preceded by, and this is followed by a dyspnea. So in COPD patient, symptoms are persistent. Usually patient is chronic cough, is having chronic cough. And uh, PFT shows post bronchodilator FEV1 by APC is less than 0.7. This is very important for the diagnosis of the COPD according to gold criteria. So post bronchodilator FEV1 by APC is less than 0.7. There are uh, patient is abnormal between symptoms. And there is usually heavy exposure to a risk factor. This is smoking and biomass fields and symptoms slowly worsen over time and rapidly acting bronchodilator treatment provides only limited relief and chest x-ray there is usually hyperinflation in hysema. So these are the main uh, differentiating points between asthma and COPD. So using the syndromic approach the prevalence of asthma COPD overlap was found to be 22.6%. So as per previous, uh, previous slide there are mainly the broad classification asthma and COPD but nowadays Another variant, as I had, I had discussed earlier, asthma COPD overlap, and this percentage is not less. This is around 22.6%. So significantly more females and smokers, ex-smokers, present with the ACO. Patients with asthma COPD overlap have worse lung function than those with the asthma COPD alone. So again, there are spirometric measures of asthma and COPD. So we, we know this is the basic, basically the importance of uh, a previous slide as well. A normal FEV1 ABC in asthma, but in COPD and asthma COPD overlap, the FEV1 ABC is usually less than 0.7. Now the post, post bronchodilator is 30% predicted. This is compatible with the diagnosis of the asthma uh, and also compatible with the only mild persistent variant of the COPD and mild variant of the overlap. Now the post bronchodilator FEV1 less than 80%. So post bronchodilator FEV1 in spite of giving bronchodilator therapy FEV1 is less than 80%. It occurs in the asthma. But where the risk factor for asthma exacerbations are more. But this is usually an indicator for severity of the airflow limitation and risk of future events in COPD. Now the post bronchodilator increase in FEV1 more than 12% and 200 ml from baseline. This is sometimes in the course of the asthma, but may not be present when they are well controlled. Common in, common in likely when the FEV1 is low in COPD. So post bronchodilator increase in FEV1 more than 12% and 400 ml. If it is 400 ml, this is the high probability of asthma, but unusual with COPD, compatible with the milder variety of asthma, variant of asthma COPD. But so post bronchodilator more than 200 ml, so chance of COPD. Post bronchodilator more than 400 ml usually in asthma. Again, this is an important slide for the day-to-day -day practice. So, which patient is uh, we going to treat as a case of as a case of asthma, and case of asthma COPD, and one is only COPD. So, as I had discussed earlier, the asthma patient symptoms may trigger in intensity, triggers in, in exercise, allergens, seasonal, age is less than 40 years. Lung function, variable airflow limitation, and persistent airflow limitations may be present. So this is asthma. This is a case of asthma. So treatment is pharmacological treatment is ICS inhaled corticosteroid. So inhaled corticosteroids containing treatment is essential. Here is treatment is essential to reduce the risk of severe exacerbations and death. Uh, so ICS plus 
formidable. That means lava plus ICS combination is important. So do not give lava and lama. So here without ICS. So in asthma, ICS is very important. We should give start with ICS and lava plus ICS combination is important. Here, uh, very few role of lama. So lava plus ICS in asthma. Now, as per previous symptoms, so COPD patients, COPD, uh, COPD plus asthma, COPD plus asthma is overlap patient symptoms, intermittent or episodic. May have started before or after age of 40 years, may have a history of smoking. Patient is history of episodic, episodic onset of symptoms, but history of smoking is present and no history of any tuberculosis in a childhood. Any of asthma features at left common trigger symptoms improve uh, spontaneously or with the bronchodilators. So, or any concurrent asthma diagnosis or asthma diagnosis in childhood. So, this is a patient of having features of both smoking and also features like asthma. So, it's an asthma COPD overlap. In this patient also, which is an asthma COPD overlap, do not treat like as a COPD only, treat as an asthma. Treatment is principally like asthma. So, inhaled corticosteroid here also is a very important role. So, ICS continuing treatment is essential here. So, as, as in an asthma patient, so asthma COPD patient also, uh, ICS is very important for the treatment. So add on lava plus lama is usually also needed. Additional COPD treatment as per gold guideline. So do not give here lava plus lama without inhaled corticosteroids. So inhaled corticosteroids has a significant role in asthma and also very important role in asthma COPD overlap. Now, in case of COPD patients, we all know in case of COPD patients, uh, treatment is initially lama plus lava. But in COPD patient, whether exacerbations is more than two, more than two per year, and also stage two, stage, stage three or four in gold, and also peripheral blood pressure level count is more than three hundred. In then this particular variant of COPD patients, the ICS treatment is essential. So with lava plus lama, inhaled corticosteroid is also very important role in this particular variant of COPD patients. So ICS has an important role in asthma, asthma COPD overlap and particular variant of COPD patients where the exacerbations are more than two times per year and patients is requiring oral corticosteroids and peripheral blood eosinophil count is more than 300 per microliter. So this, which COPD patients will benefit from ICS as by my previous, guide, previous slide. Again, this, this particular variant of COPD patients where the uh, ICS is very important. One is asthma COPD overlap and number two is this Advanced COPD patient stage three onwards, more than two exacerbations, and blood eosinophil count is more than 300. Now, the combination therapy of inhaled steroids and long acting beta 2 agonists in asthma COPD. Now, this study showed that the asthma COPD overlap patients with mild to moderate airflow limitations showed the greater response in lung function after three months of ICS plus lava combination therapy. <clears throat> so, this, this slide that I had discussed earlier tells us for the indication of inhaled corticosteroids in COPD patients. Now the what are the comorbidities in COPD patients? The most important comorbidity in COPD patients in nowadays are cardiovascular, cardiovascular comorbid condition, cardiovascular disease. So the 70% prevalence rate of cardiovascular disease is observed in COPD patients. Now this is another study we can see here the most important severity in our study was ischemic heart disease followed by the congestive heart failure and stroke. And prevalence of CVD among the patients with COPD in this study was around 60%. So we can see here these are the COPD stages, stage 1, 2, 3, 4. As the stages are increasing, stage 3 onwards, the prevalence of CVD is also increases. So the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in COPD patients is also increasing nowadays. Now, you can see here, these are the various cardiovascular comorbidities. A study done in Indian population shows the high prevalence of cardiac comorbidities, pulmonary hypertension, left ventricular dysfunction in COPD patients. The severity of comorbid conditions increases with severity of the COPD and makes a linear relation. Now, we have to choose a safe molecule for the COPD patients with the cardiovascular comorbid condition because uh, the comorbidities are increasing. So, so, since the CVD are the most common comorbidities of COPD patients, both COPD and cardiovascular disease are centrally linked to systemic inflammation. So the salmeterol fluticasone has a broad spectrum of anti-inflammatory effects of COPD. 
which may contribute to nickel efficacy. So in this study, we can say the salmonella fruticazole is a safe molecule. Dinesh. Where is the challenge? Uh, I think there is some technical network issue. We'll resume shortly. Please bear with us. So, salmonella fruticazone combination. So, fruticazone is a potent inhaled corticosteroid. It's a high lipophilicity, longer duration of action. So, it's a very safe molecule for COPD patients with cardiovascular diseases. <coughs> So these are the many studies it shows. They are the anti-inflammatory acts of the salmonella fruticazone combination. So these are the studies and we can see here the neutrophils reduce and neutrophil related inflammation in the airways has been reduced with a fruticazone treatment. Now it's a broad spectrum anti-inflammatory effects in both smokers and non-smokers and COPD patients. And this combination therapy also reduced the CD8 plus cytotoxic T cell lympho T lymphocytes and CD68 macrophages. So basically, this salmonella fruticazone combination has an anti inflammatory effect. So, two important factors it has also anti inflammatory effects and also it's a safe at this one. At, uh, it has been proved in many as, various studies. So, inhaled long acting beta 2 agonists do not increase the fetal cardiovascular adverse effects in COPD patients. So different studies, uh, you can see here around 12,291 patients received inhaled lava and uh, passive patients. So inhaled lava significantly decreased fetal cardiovascular events in long term and trial. Different so basically, Safety of some The conclusion was there is some technical issue happening. Please bear with us.
So this is an important study, the landmark study towards a revolution in COPD health tort study. And it shows the salmonella fruticosin was shown to improve the pulmonary function symptoms and to reduce the exacerbations. So basically, it's a very effective combination and also it's a safe in cardiovascular disease. Now, the cardiovascular events in patients with post hoc analysis and it shows it is a significant with models. So thus it is it is uh, not harmful for the cardiovascular health. It do not cause any adverse effects of cardiovascular patients. So in COPD patients as a lava with a cardiovascular risk factor present or having cardiovascular diseases, we can use it along with combination with fruticosin combination. So, effects of fruticosin and propionate on arterial stiffness in patients with COPD. Here, the multicenter randomized double blinded study and compare with the effects of this combination versus placebo on aortic pulse wave velocity. And the result was SFC, this combination doesn't reduce the aortic pulse wave velocity in all patients with moderate to severe COPD, but may have effects on those with elevated arterial stiffness. So, it may have effects on those with elevated arterial stiffness, but usually do not reduce this arterial stiffness in all patients. So basically, the contrary remark was, India contributes a significant and growing percentage of COPD mortality. And approximately two thirds of the population use biomass fuel for cooking purpose. Thus the biomass fuel is a greater hazard for the COPD in India. Now a study, different study shows that a chronic exposure of high levels of biomass fuel increases the possibility of systemic inflammation and the prevalence of asthma COPD overlap was found to be about 23 percent. Now the inhaled corticosteroid in combination with a long acting bronchodilator should be considered as a first line for the treatment of asthma COPD overlap. Now the COPD often exists with other diseases, other comorbidities and that may have a significant impact on the health but both COPD and cardiovascular diseases are centrally linked to systemic inflammation. Now, we have to choose a molecule which is basically effective, which reduces the inflammation and also it's, it will be safe for the for this type of patients. So, salmonella fruticosin combination has a broad spectrum of anti-inflammatory effects on the COPD. And furthermore, cardiovascular safety of salmonella in COPD patients has been demonstrated. And the post hoc analysis of the cardiovascular events in TOR study suggested the lava ICS combination may be also cardioprotective. Thank you. Uh, right, sir. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, so we have a few questions from the audiences. The first question is from Dr. Amita. Uh, Amita, she's asking how frequently the eosinophilic inflammation should be assessed in echo patients. So in, uh, how should be assessed? So in COPD patients, in yeah. COPD patients, whenever we are trying treatment with lava plus uh, anti muscarinic agonist, lava plus lama, but but the uh, symptoms are not improving. Or uh, in stage three onwards, stage three or four, gold staging three or four, whenever patient is not improving, then we may suspect this may be a case of not only COPD, there may be other variants. So we should do a blood eosinophil count. Usually, blood eosinophil count is if it is less than hundred, less than hundred. In that case. We, we can wait, but if it is more than 300, as per gold guideline, if it is more than 300, we should use uh, inhaled corticosteroid for COPD patient. So, so for a blood eosinophil count, if it is more than 300, we may think for uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Because of. Uh, so the next question is, which is a better marker, sputum eosinophilia or a peripheral blood? Uh, see, sputum eosinophil count, eosinophilia is a better marker. Uh, because blood eosinophil count may increases in may various conditions, many parasitic infection, but many times it is very difficult to assess the sputum eosinophil count. So I think both should both but a sputum eosinophil count and blood eosinophil count should be assessed because uh, many times we may miss eosinophil count eosinophil assessment in sputum, but definitely sputum eosinophil count is better. But I think both should be done 
and uh, as per guideline uh, blood urine sample count is easier to assess and it's a prognostic marker for the treatment of cpd patient okay sir the next question is pretty interesting is there a role of ics laba in the management of post tubercular airway disease no actually in tubercular only if it is only fibrosis only post tubercular fibrosis there is no role of laba plus ics treatment but usually what happen in post tubercular or post infection there is bronchiectasis and this contributed for the development of the copd patient so if the patient is having air flow limitation and as per gold guideline in post history of post tuberculosis in the past and this patient is having post bronchodilator fev1 by mpc is less than 0.7 and uh, without significant reversibility in that case and we can use laba plus ics but this is not the first line treatment so tuberculosis post tuberculosis patient is not a indication for starting inhaled corticosteroid if this patient is having uh, more than two exacerbations in a year then we may think of ics but post tb patient post tb fibrosis is not a indication for starting ics right sir uh, so the next question is uh, is there an impact of smoking status on ics efficacy while treating these patients mm, uh, this actually uh, a very important question actually smoking smoking increases the uh, severity of the copd as it is also causes the increase increase systemic inflammation but uh, uh, i do not have many studies i don't know whether smoking uh, uh, reduces the efficacy of the ics but overall overall it reduces the efficacy of the ics because the disease will be progressing and systemic inflammation will be more So definitely if the systemic inflammation is it is it is increasing uh, for the chronic exposure to smoke so definitely the uh, effects of ics what we, we, we what which which should we should expect it will be decreasing uh, it is not ant- antagonizing the effects of ics but it overall increases the disease burden this is severity for that reason we may we may get decrease efficacy of the ics definitely we may get decrease efficacy of the ics uh, but uh, smoking uh, is not uh, antagonizing the effect of ics i think uh, right sir so the next question is uh, clinically do you manage smoker copd and a non smoker copd separately mm, no treatment is not separate The smoker COPD and non-smoker COPD treatment is not separate. Separate treatment is same as per gold gold guideline. So first we should start with a, if it is a stable COPD patient, we should start with LABA plus LAMA. Then we should wait whether he is responsive or not. Uh, we have to check regular PFT and then we have to assess whether it is as much COPD overlap or we uh, increase blood urine sample count. So treatment is not separate. treatment is basically uh, in our day to day practice when it is shortness of breath patient is having shortness of breath in non smoker patient and whenever we are excluding the effects of uh, it, is, it is not a congestive cardiac failure or cardiovascular causes so if it is lung causes of shortness of breath if it is non smoker many time many time we may suspect it is a case of asthma but the but the from the history if this patient this patient is having the chronic symptoms is never symptom free Also, also history of uh, history of uh, history of uh, allergy, history of atopy in the childhood, and also this patient is having uh, some chronic symptoms. So we may think this is a case of asthma COPD overlap. The treatment. So this is not about uh, non-smoker or smoker. We have to identify whether we are treating a patient of only only COPD or COPD or COPD with overlap. so if it is non copd patient in female patient and this patient is having history of biomass fuel exposure in the kitchen then this is a copd patient this is and there are no symptoms like asthma then we should treat her like a normal copd patient but the like in like in any 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 smoker patient but if this patient is having having a history like a asthma copd overlap in that case along with laba plus lama we should add ics so in that case if this non smoker patient is behaving like asthma copd overlap in that case the treatment principle will be changed otherwise treatment protocol is same for non smoker or smoker right sir 
So the another question is: Is there an increased incidence of pneumonia in echo patients when given ICS? Definitely, definitely in asthma COPD, the 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 asthma in asthma COPD over that percent the chances of pneumonia is more than only asthma or only COPD. So at over in over that percent the infection is more than other patient because in many time we miss the diagnosis and uh, in for that reason. The asthma COPD patients are on on many times are underdiagnosed. So definitely, in various studies, it has been proved in asthma COPD overlap patients the infection is more than only asthma or only COPD patient. Right, sir. The next question is from Dr. Pawan. The question is quite interesting. How would you manage COPD patients who have persistently high eosinophilia? See, in uh, persistently high eosinophil count, then along with lava plus ICS, in that case, if the patient is uh, patient is uh, uh, having having attacks more than two or three attacks, then we should we may increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroid. And we know that oral steroids are not indicated for the chronic management, but in many cases, we can in our day to day practice we we have seen that uh, we have to add oral steroid for a few days, but Uh, uh, I think with the uh, with the uh, proper proper management and proper compliance, patient compliance, peripheral eosinophilic count can be managed because the inhaled corticosteroid is the only treatment option for this chronic management of this this type of COPD patients. So and in many time many times with parasitic infection we may use some um, anti-parasitic drug like albendazole for a short time. But otherwise, with the regular and judicious use of inhaled corticosteroids, uh, uh, we may manage this peripheral eosinophilia. I think it will it will be managed because oral steroid is not indicated for the long term. So, judi only use the judicious use of ICS with patient's compliance. Right, uh, Doctor Rajneesh is asking: uh, Is there a more rapid Lung function decline in patients with echo than COPD. Uh, not more rapid, but obviously the lung function deterioration is more in uh, asthma COPD over the patient. It has been established definitely. This uh, for for this reason we should diagnose whether it is a case of only COPD or asthma asthma COPD overlap. Definitely, uh, the lung function is worsening in asthma COPD over the patient uh, rather than only COPD or only asthma. Definitely, and as I had said earlier, the chance of infection is also more. Right, sir. This I think appears to be the last question, unless I refresh my screen. The question is from uh, Jabalpur, uh, Doctor P K Singh. Does asthma and airway hyperresponsiveness predispose patients to develop COPD in the later life? Definitely, the patient, the patient uh, with history of asthma, patient with history of asthma, uh, with history of airway hyperresponsiveness. If this patient is having the other cofactors for the cofactors, co- my comorbidities for the COPD like smoker, smoke or by mass exposure, so this patient may develop COPD also. This is this, this is the asthma COPD overlap. So, if the asthma patient, if the asthma patient is having the other risk factors also of if the, if if a asthma patient smokes regularly. A patient who who are having the history of childhood uh, uh, childhood infection, history of um, allergy, history of atopy in a family. So this patient, if this patient smokes regularly, so this patient this patient is also develops COPD. And uh, but only asthma, only asthma. Uh, if it is not if it is not treated regularly, this is also a contributory factors for the development of the COPD. With addition of the other risk factors, definitely in the future. Uh, so one more question has come: uh, How best to manage exacerbation case post pneumonia in COPD patients? Post pneumonia and COPD patients for the exacerbation. Yes. No exacerbation is. Uh, sorry, post pneumonia. Yeah. Should I repeat? Yes. 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 How best to manage exacerbation patients post pneumonia? In COPD cases, see if it is post pneumonia also in COPD patients. So as per the treatment guideline, as per principle number one is systemic corticosteroid. We have to add the systemic corticosteroids in exacerbations. 
also and number two is oxygen number three is antibiotics antibiotic also a very important role and uh, if it is a post pneumonia patient was treated for pneumonia and then after a few weeks patient has developed uh, exacerbations definitely in that case we should rule out any other viral cause if it is a viral now in uh, in post post covid we can say there are many virus which triggers the uh, copd exacerbations so post pneumonia patients for the management of copd again we have to add we have to search for a inf- infective cause so we should give a broad spectrum antibiotics we should give the antibiotics against atypical coverage atypical bacteria next is systemic steroids for the for a few days then oxygenation now according to severity or ex- oxygen modality will be changed either through laser cannula or with oxygen with reservoir back so so and 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 we should treat the other comorbidities like diabetes if the patient is diabetes or other cardiovascular risk factors present so we should uh, concentrate for the glycemic control of the patient so treatment principle is same antibiotics systemic steroids for the short duration then inhaled corticosteroid definitely nebulization is a role nebulization definitely nebulization and uh, next is oxygen and uh, control of other comorbid conditions yeah uh right sir these were all the questions from the audiences uh so i think we are done with the questions now let me just check again if there are any other questions coming uh no so i think this was the last question uh well sir i thank again uh dr kaushik for this beautiful session knowledgeable session that he has given on the topic today and i also thank all the delegates who have been uh, who have been a wonderful audience for this session thank you very much thank you everyone thank you dr kashik again thank thanks so much thank you thank you okay. bye bye sir okay. dinesh you may please disconnect now